Welcome to the Change Within Podcast. This is Gerard Uselli here. We are on episode 11. Things have been getting very exciting to ensure that we're talking to so many people throughout the community at large, going through the COVID pandemic and seeing how they embrace their sense of change throughout their lives. And we have a very special guest, somebody who is a great writer, director, and actress, good friend of mine, Becky Boggs. Becky, how are you? Good, that was such like a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Short and sweet is always the good finish. Yeah, how are you doing? Always doing well. And uh, kind of like in a way where for somebody like me, I really don't, I haven't had so many guests who are not necessarily from Staten Island. So a nice change of pace on that one. So what I'm curious about is what was your childhood like growing up? Like, where are you from? Um, that's a loaded question. Uh, but yeah, I'm from, Great way to start, originally, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm originally from outside Philly in the suburbs and I grew up with, um, my, my mom and my sister and my dad, he passed away, unfortunately, when I was 10 from cancer, mm. but up until then I had a really like typical loving, ideal American family. So I'm really fortunate for that. Um, and then obviously some challenges after that, I went to high school, was always ambitious. Um, my mom always instilled in me that I could do whatever I wanted to do, which I'm really thankful for. And so I've always been really ambitious with everything with sports and school. And I never really liked the class environment, but I still did well in it. Um, then I went to college in South Carolina and then oh, I wow. studied abroad in South Africa <laughs> and then I um came back to Philly this is this is gonna sound really random I feel like I've lived like a hundred lives but then I came back to Philly and was in advertising worked at an advertising agency for five months and then I quit and moved to New York for acting initially so now I'm here well, what a great rebuttal with a loaded answer on that one. So with everything that you said, what, um, what I'm curious about is what do you think between everything that you did was like your biggest sense of change growing up? Do you think that it was more in the sense of traveling to like, uh, to, to like some, to a new state like South Carolina or going to like South Africa? And I, what I hear a lot more is the culture shock of coming back home to something Ooh, like Pennsylvania. Yeah, it's so big. That's so funny how you've heard that. Um, always since I can remember, I've always been the person that tries to make myself uncomfortable. So I literally went to school in South Carolina because I knew no one and I just wanted to learn more about myself and in a new situation. And then that's the same reason why I went to South Africa, Africa because I knew no one and I just wanted to learn more about my life and me as a human. So and also I volunteered there as well, but I, the culture shock, first of all, culture shock when I got there was bad, I thought. Um, and it took me, I think I finally maybe settled in. It's still a third world country. So it's very different than here. Um, I, it took me like until the last month, I think to settle in. I was in there for uh, six months and then I came back. I remember I came back after like the 36 hour flight, like including layovers and shit. And I came back to like some random airport, forget where it was. Like maybe it was in like fucking, I don't know, like Idaho, like somewhere random. Oh and I God. walked into the airport and there, they had so many different shops and everything I could ever want was there in that airport. And that was so different than South Africa. Like you had to walk literally miles just to get to class. So I kid you not, I sat on the ground and I kissed the airport ground because I was that happy to be back in the US. <laughs> wow, that must be something. So as far as all your traveling, this is something that kind of sparks a lot of interest with me. When you're traveling to different airports and kind of in like your detour time and things of that sort, what was kind of like your most spontaneous find? as far as just like maybe staying over somewhere for a night and you had no expectations? Hmm. I don't know if I have any like cool layover stories. I'm normally just like cranky and quiet and sleeping. 
Uh, I think, I mean, the one of the transfer flights uh, to South Africa was Amsterdam. And I remember just waiting, we were like sleeping in the airport because we couldn't leave the airport because it would be this whole huge hassle of having to recheck everything. But they had to de-ice the plane for like two hours. And I just was right. thinking, is it even safe to fly right now? Like they're de-icing the plane and you could see them like spraying it with whatever, warm air. But yeah, I don't know. that was a weird story that I remember. <laughs> Well, in that regard too, like, I'm sure you've probably had to travel being an actress. Like what was kind of like your first big break as far as traveling somewhere else and how did it feel in difference as far as doing something like that for a gig versus what you would do for a typical vacation? So the best place I've ever traveled to for a job, this was actually for a modeling job, was to uh, Mexico. It was Tulum. And I think this was like a few years ago. And I actually did it two, two summers in a row because uh, me and the client got along well. And they got us like a villa for a week, me and the other model. And it just was so fun because, I mean, we worked probably at least 12 hours a day because we were on like the resort with the client. So it was a lot of work and it was really hot. Um, but it was so fun and I love working. So that wasn't a big deal. And then after we were done, we all get dinner together and go in the water. And there was like donkeys running around and we're in like the jungle. So that was probably the coolest. Now, I don't know if this is just me, but especially after working something like a 12 hour shift and I could be the minority in this one, but we'll see. Do you feel like when you work more hours, you want to have more fun after? Yeah, I think you need a release. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I think with everything, I think when you're more, when you're busier, you're more productive in every way, you know, your energy level is like up. It's like, it's like the adrenaline rush that you've been desiring, but the only way to get it is through working hard. Like it's weird. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think you and I both love working, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you gotta, I guess you work hard and you play hard too. Was there ever a job kind of like within that world too, like when you were acting, what was kind of something you really took like on the spot, like literally no preparation time and just, you had to just jump right in. Well, most commercials are like that. Yeah. Uh, unless it's a film, like with every film you have sometimes even months to prepare. I actually have a film in a month and I already know that I have to film it. So I have all this time, but for commercials, sometimes they don't even tell the actors like they don't give the actors a storyboard or anything uh the narrative or whatever so you show up and they're like okay this is what's happening uh you're like you're you're depressed in this scene and then this makes you happy this product makes you happy uh so go do that so it's pretty much a lot of improv and on the fly situations so i don't know i feel like almost you would be good at it you're good at public speaking and talking and it's I think it has similar aspects to that, just thinking on your feet. In reflection of that, and I thought about this today because I've been a substitute teacher for some time now, I feel like when you get pulled into different classrooms and literally being put on the spot as far as, okay, you have to teach fifth grade social studies and not even having like any prep beforehand, not to say that it's really similar to what you do, but at the same time, you do have to put on an act of competence to ensure that you have the class, uh, not the classmates, the uh, students on your side. Yes. And it's just really trusting your instincts, which I love to do in life in general too. So I think with public speaking and you going into a class, like after one second of knowing it's the same thing. You got to trust your gut, trust your instincts that you have confidence that you're capable of doing whatever's thrown at you. What was one time in that regard, like in an acting role where you feel like you really made it your own, like whether it was a past project that you worked on, maybe, maybe something that's not more like in your control, but something that like you've been hired for. And like in that predicament, you, you really just ran with it. Like you did something that special that you wouldn't even expect for yourself. Something special that I wouldn't expect for myself. Uh, I try to do that with every role, hopefully, uh, just to have as much fun as possible and to be authentic to my instincts and the character. Uh, um, I would have to say the most interesting role is the one that, um, 
Well, were you were you there for the clown shoot with Chris? I was not there for that one, but I've heard some stories about that. Okay, I just remember that right now. I'm like, if I had to like the most interesting and fun character, even though that was just for promotional stuff for the film, um, the Colin of Franklin County, if we're promoting stuff right yeah. now. Uh, <laughs> Chris, shout out. Um, but for one of the promotional stuff, uh, Chris made me be an evil clown um, as an ode to, I don't even know, uh, don't kill me Chris and horror fans. I can't even think of the name of this clown, but it's like an ode to that. And we just went into the woods with like a group, a small crew and I got to just act uh, crazy and evil and uh, tap into my true self with this clown makeup and hair and full outfit on and yeah and then we we stopped at a gas station on the way home and Chris was like you should get out and pump the gas in your clown outfit and I'm like okay and this is like a scary ass clown outfit like it's the scary it's not the fun funny cute kind so I go out and just everyone is staring and Chris is like cracking up in the back of the car <laughs> that is awesome <laughs> what did you like go into the stores at all because that would no been I just sanity that would have been I think I was probably too scared to do that I just I was outside just pumping the gas <laughs> Can, can you no you you should have like had some sort of business cards like in the meantime be like looking for business i'll leave my business cards yes. here yes. Water parties no big deal i got you <laughs> next time i'll do that the next time i have to dress up creepy i'll do that i think it's fun scaring people <laughs> <laughs> now with all the imdb credits associated with your name what's one famous movie that you've always liked that you wish your name was attached to in that regard? Um, well, my favorite movie um, is Silver Linings Playbook. So I, I guess I would say that. I think it's the, the most perfect movie in every way to like the writing, to the acting, to the shots, everything is so perfect and authentic and real and just so good. So I guess that. There you go. And as you started directing movies and kind of getting more credits in that regard too, like who's one director that you feel like you looked up, you look up to the most as well? I've never really consciously looked up to anyone. Um, it's, but I would have to say um, David O. Russell because of Silver Linings Playbook. I feel like style wise, I think subconsciously I've like picked up similarities like to his style just from watching movies over the years. And, and like I said, I think everything he did was perfect. Uh, and then my oh, other nice favorite, <laughs> yeah. And then um, my other favorite movie is Inception, which is kind of the polar opposite. It's like- Oh my God. Band. That's actually Cinematic. one of my favorites too. Is it? Like on a serious yeah. note, like it's, it's one of my top five favorite movies of all time. Wow. Well, you have good taste. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, so I guess Christopher Nolan too. Do, do, do you feel like with Inception, now Leonardo DiCaprio has been somebody who is just prolific in what he does. Would oh. you consider that your favorite Leonardo DiCaprio movie? Ooh, that's hard. I feel like almost everything he does is like every movie he's been in is great because his acting is so great. Um, I'm so bad with names with people and movies and everything and people get on it my makes ass. makes sense though. I get that. But um, I, there's a movie that he did that took place almost entirely in a house and it's about like the suburbia life maybe back in the 1960s. And I, I forget what it's called, but He's really great in it. <laughs> so maybe that one. But it's always an ending cool. plug in any regard. When you don't know, yeah. just say that they're good. Yeah, but they're good. <laughs> kind of, like kind of to put yourself in like actors and actresses' shoes, as you've been a director for quite some time too. When you when you staff like these people and trying to give them like advice, like how would you emphasize with them as they seek to embrace a role that you're directing? 
Oh, it's so easy because I am an actor. I've been an actor. So um, I feel like I communicate really well with them in a way that they understand that doesn't offend them. I know how they feel, how they're feeling in that moment. I know how I'd want to be talked to by a director. So that's what I do. And I've just seen, I've been on so many sets where um, directors don't know how to communicate. So I'm just like very hyper aware that I don't want to be like that. And I want everyone to be comfortable so they give their best work and they understand like what I'm trying to do here or the movie won't turn out how my shot list and storyboard looks, you know? I'm sure contingent upon like the film that you make, but how are you with takes? Are you one of those people that likes to have more takes the better? Are you one of those people that kind of wants to evaluate how like each one is and kind of like analyze for yourself if less is more? I'm very specific. So I know exactly what I need and I don't fuck around. So we get it and we go. Um, and normally, and that's what I, I love to do because then the finished product looks exactly like how it looked in your mind. And there's in the editing room, there's not so many choices you have to make because you're looking at your storyboard and shot list and you're like, this is what I need to pull. Um, and in terms of like, if, if the, actor's performance isn't good enough um obviously I want to try to get it uh, out of them but if it's taking too long normally time is always of the essence because uh just naturally we try to shove in I feel like every filmmaker tries to shove in all these shots that are just impossible to get so we're always behind but normally it's if it's a one take then it's so nice to move on I'd rather just move on is there a genre that you haven't worked on yet that kind of that you kind of want to get off your bucket list? For directing? For directing, yeah. Um, well, I actually, I just, uh, they're not finished, but I have three films that are half, they're each halfway done. And one's uh, a thriller, a drama, and a rom-com. So, <laughs> so I think I want to do it all. Uh, rom-coms being my least favorite but it's this is a challenge for me to write because I don't really like them so much um but yeah I guess if I had to pick I really want to be able to write just an amazing feature film drama that feels really authentic and the dialogue is really authentic yeah and kind of on the essence of like what a rom-com is it's very difficult to have some of the cheesy establishment already like predicated in that type of sense versus yeah. like how you want to make something so succinct and how it could just like impact an audience. Like as far as in that regard, let's say, let's say if you've had any screenings with your films, like were there ever moments where like maybe the audience reacted to something where you were just like, wait, I didn't even think anything of it. So yeah, well, the first film that I wrote and directed, produced myself uh, was called Nice Things. And it's a experimental film about the negative effects of materialism and um, like social media. So I put in a lot of uh, intentional foreshadowing and imagery in there, but there were a few things that I hadn't even thought of that, yeah, just like by coincidence, they made sense. I'm trying to think. Mm. Just the, the, the biggest satisfaction is how it starts a conversation because people will then message me and be like, wow, this just made me how think of society does this unconsciously to people. And, and I haven't really been paying attention to the values that I wanna be paying attention to. and stuff like that. It's like starting the conversation. So then that begins a, a change. So a change can happen. Absolutely. And as the movie industry, as we all know, has been on a pause in 2020 to the, due to the pandemic, how have you kept yourself busy within that time span? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a bit of a sour note for me, but I'm going to, I can vaguely tell you. So from the beginning of the pandemic, last March, I had started creating, writing, directing, producing um, a project. And I was doing that for the entire year of 2020. And about two months ago, we were supposed to start 
and finish a post on it. And unfortunately, I chose to work with the wrong person. And now it's a legal situation. So I'm trying to like dance around <laughs> it. But now I don't have anything to show for this last year. And I'm currently fighting for that right now. Um, but I have faith that the truth always comes out in the end and things always work out and it'll, it'll work out in the end. I've come to realize this too. And think of this a little bit more holistically. And of course, not to go into any detail, but this is just a statement for me. I feel like for a lot of directors, as they've established films over time, licensing, what, what have you, as far as even music rights, the simplest things that you would think of, even the most successful directors, there's going to be issues inevitably. And there's so many different like cross marks that people have to go check with. And it's, it's just one of those things that I'll just say to you as like a friend, don't feel bad about that type of stuff because this is going to be part of the business. Like there will be things like this that do come up, whether it's on a more minor scale or a more major one. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. And I am so thankful that this happened in the beginning or in the earlier part of my career, because now I'll, this mistake will never happen again in the future. Like I'll make sure all my ducks are in the row uh, before I do another project with people that I don't uh, know that well. And it's just a learning lesson. And I'm glad I didn't have a, like a billion dollars on the line when I made this project. So now when I do in the future, I won't make the same mistake and everything will be okay. Absolutely. And kind of as a final point, and aside from that being your probably your biggest change that you want to focus on now, what's kind of like your overall change that you want to really see for yourself this year? For myself? Yeah, for, for yourself, people? like in any projects that you're pursuing, like other than the one you were talking about? Um, for myself, yeah. I mean, it would be, that was such a big lesson that, I, that has been following me. Like you hear that saying that a lesson will keep like trying to be taught to you until you actually learn it. So I think the lesson is I need to um, not ignore red flags. <laughs> in like people that I work with or people that I have in my life because I've been tending to do that and it keeps biting me in the ass. So just being more conscious of who I'm letting onto my team, um, into my life because who you surround yourself with is literally everything. It's everything, like it'll make or break you. So being more intentional, more conscious about that. Absolutely. And I'm sure you could agree with me on this as a final note, the sense of experience of being around somebody, especially in projects like that, there's always going to be things that you pick up along the way. So there, it, there should never be like an aspect of feeling bad about yourself with because if you did it, if you did it differently or thought about like the regrets of it in your pastime, there's nothing that you would be able to really learn from it unless you went through the motions yourself. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you feel just so much wiser after it and then having the ability to tell other people about it. So maybe they can be wiser too is, is good. So, I mean, there's definitely positive that comes out of bad things in life. And also it just makes life more interesting. Like now I know a lot of shit about lawyers and legal situations, which is cool to me and, and psychology. I'm, I'm kind of into psychology too. So. <laughs> absolutely well there's definitely ways we could both change with fan and 2021 is definitely going to be a year of doing so thank you so much for viewing the change within podcast you can see us on anchor instagram facebook and youtube becky thank you very much for joining and have a great night thanks so much jerry you're awesome <laughs> you too <laughs>